Since time immemorial, humankind has lived in the belief that all earthly thought and action is circumscribed by the all-seeing eye of God. God the Absolute, the fount of all truth. Even if we sinned in secret, if our crimes went unpunished on earth, God would see into our hearts and minds, and we would be subject to his divine justice. In each of the major world religions, the act of confession is an important article of faith. Confess your sins, and in God's mercy, you will be absolved of them. But refuse to confess, and you will be judged accordingly. Then, in Europe, towards the end of the 17th century, a group of intellectuals started to emphasize reason and individualism rather than tradition. They called it the Enlightenment. In trying to understand the world, rather than seeing in the darkness of their ignorance the workings of some mysterious otherworldly power, they took as their starting point the assumption that the thinking self, not faith, is the basis of everything. They advocated extending the light of knowledge through the scientific method, conclusions tested by evidence and logic. Mankind was not simply subject to God's predestination. Men and women had control over their own destinies and could mould the earth around them. It was a revolution in thought. Man was the measure of his own life. From this theoretical development sprung the modern arts and the sciences, the notions of individuality, of the relativity of multiple truths, and of privacy, a part of each of us that was ours and ours alone that no one else saw into unless we chose to share it. And the logical extension from this, a separation between the public and private spheres. Gradually, we started to move away from the notion that an all-seeing eye in the sky looked over us. Many continued to believe in God, but an increasing number chose not to. Mankind was entering the age of secularism, in the void left by a departing God, new questions were raised. What now is the purpose of life? What is truth? And more practically, if men and women no longer feared the all-seeing eye of divine justice, what was there to restrain them from sin? From lying and cheating and thieving and murdering? For the most iconic proposal for dealing with this brave new world, step forward, Jeremy Bentham. A late 18th century British philosopher, jurist and social reformer, Bentham also spent 16 years of his life designing a new form of prison, which he hoped the government would adopt for a national penitentiary and appoint him as governor contractor. He named this new prison Panopticon. The prison's unique selling point was in its architectural layout. In the centre would be a watchtower, the guards within hidden from view by an elaborate system of Venetian blinds and mirrors. Surrounding the watchtower there'd be a second circular building divided into cells. Each cell, with windows in both its inner and outer walls, would house one prisoner. The prisoners would, therefore, be both separated and in a state of constant visibility, not only to the guards hidden from view, but also to the entire world outside. Every movement of every prisoner could be seen. For them, there would be no such things as either a community 
or a private life. And it wouldn't even matter whether there were any guards in the watchtower. The prisoners would never know. They would instead live constantly aware of the possibility of being watched, monitored by an all-seeing, invisible eye, and they would amend their behavior accordingly. It was a mill for grinding rogues honest, Bentham proudly described his design. And yet this new design wasn't intended to be merely tyrannical. The omni-surveillance was for the prisoners' protection as much as their punishment. Theoretically, the guards could be monitored by the public as much as the prisoners, which led to another consequence. We are all guards now, and we are all guarded. Unfortunately for Bentham, no true panopticon was ever built. But his legacy was far more profound than a mere blueprint for penal institutions. More and more momentum his proposals would gain, their reach expanding at a giddying rate. Soon, every institution would be regulated on the panopticon principles of segregation, timetables, discipline. Not only prisons, but schools, hospitals, factories, and the ubiquitous office. Fast forward to the present day, and what do we see but an increasingly elaborate form of checks and balances? A relentless documentation of our every act, thought, and word spoken. CCTV cameras for our personal safety and security, recording our every presence in the urban landscape. Satellites from on high, for our protection, tracking every movement and broadcasting our entertainment. Our every use of transport, logged for all eternity. For administrative ease, for greater convenience, our financial activities documented. For education, to sate and stoke our curiosity, the democratic freedom of information of the internet. Whilst national governments and transnational corporations track our navigation of the World Wide Web and then use this data to fine-tune their advertising and thus facilitate our consumption. The relentless corporate and state intrusion into our private lives. The omnipresent, usually invisible, eye of technology. Rarely a day goes by now without some article in the media. The journalist tone, one of barely suppressed paranoia, about how we're sleepwalking into a surveillance society. But what of the ways we willingly surrender one's private aspects of ourselves to the public realm? Reality TV shows, confessional blogs, social networking websites where we constantly publicize the smallest minutiae of our lives, our thoughts and actions, our hopes, and fears. We welcome it as much as fear it. What we are witnessing is a fundamental redefinition of human identity, that balance between our public and private selves. The all-seeing eye of God is being replaced with the man-made all-seeing eye of technology. We have moved from the divine to the digital. We have come full circle, but we no longer confess to God. We confess to one another.